people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. India and Britain have agreed to boost their defence cooperation as discussed during Prime Minister Boris Johnson's two-day visit to India this week. The two sides also expressed their commitments towards the much-anticipated trade deal which they said would be finalised by the year-end. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson received a grand reception in India this week after he finally made it to the country for a two-day official trip. Johnson had to cancel his visit twice in the past owing to COVID scare. The two sides reviewed the entire gamut of ties and committed to further deepening their defence and business cooperation, especially in the backdrop of transitions being witnessed in the global order. Johnson announced that it would liberalise arms exports to India as the countries deepen their cooperation in defence. He said his government will also issue an open general export licence for India, which will mean separate licences are not needed for individual contracts. The UK is creating an India-specific open general export licence reducing bureaucracy and slashing delivery times for defence procurement. We've agreed to work together to meet new threats across land, sea, air, space and cyber, including partnering on new fighter jet technology, maritime technologies to detect and respond to threats in the ocean. Britain hopes its offer of closer security ties with the West will encourage India to cut its defence reliance on Russia. India is heavily reliant on Russia for its defence procurements and they both call each other strategic allies. Johnson said Britain would also support India's goal of building its own fighter jets to reduce expensive imports of military equipment. India now has a mix of Russian, British and French fighter jets. The government has also been pushing to develop aircrafts indigenously. Last year, it gave a $6.28 billion contract to state-owned Hindustan Aeronautics Limited for 83 light combat aircraft Tejas for delivery starting around 2023. The leaders also signed agreements related to energy partnerships. India stressed on dialogue and diplomacy to resolve the Ukraine conflict and immediate ceasefire. हमने यूक्रेन में तुरंत युद्ध विराम और समस्या के समाधान के लिए डायलॉग और डिप्लोमेसी पर बल दिया। हमने सभी देशों की क्षेत्रीय अखंडता और संप्रभुता के सम्मान का महत्व भी दोहराया। आज हमने अपने क्लाइमेट और एनर्जी पार्टनरशिप को और अधिक गहन करने का निर्णय लिया। India and UK also agreed to reduce tariffs on mutual imports. The UK is already the seventh largest export destination for India, and India's trade and investment relationship with the UK has been successful. Bilateral trade between the two countries, export and imports together, increased by 22.7% from fiscal year 2009 2010 to 13.1 billion US dollars in fiscal year 2020 2021. Today, India has become the fifth largest economy in the world, with the United Kingdom marginally behind at the sixth. Experts say that both countries with immense potential have a bright bilateral future and can significantly contribute in enhancing each other's capabilities. Moving on. 
Former Prime Minister of Pakistan Imran Khan has demanded fresh elections after the Shehbaz Sharif-led government took over following his ouster from power through a no-confidence motion. Khan asked his supporters to be ready for his call to march towards Islamabad if his demand to call fresh elections was delayed. Meanwhile, the government, which the experts urged to take unpopular decisions to prevent any further deterioration in its economic situation, has said that it won't be slashing any subsidies in immediate future. Within a week after Imran Khan, the former Prime Minister who lost a confidence motion on the floor of the lower house of the parliament has asked for fresh elections. Pakistan general elections are slated to be conducted in August next year when the assembly dissolves. Earlier Khan along with his over 100 lawmakers in the lower house of the parliament resigned post his loss. Khan warned that Pakistan faces an enormous challenge to revive a better economy. मैं सिर्फ एक चीज चाहता हूं कोई और चीज नहीं चाहता मैं चाहता हूं कि जल्दी से जल्दी इलेक्शन अनाउंस किए जाएं हम जमुरियत चाहते हैं लेकिन हम कभी भी इस सिलेक्टेड इंपोर्टेड हुकूमत को कभी तस्लीम नहीं करेंगे एक ही तरीका है एक ही तरीका है जिनसे भी गलती हो गई एक ही तरीका है गलती ठीक करने का फौरी इलेक्शन करवाओ Khan reiterated that he was out of power due to pursuing an independent foreign policy for Pakistan which he said was not liked by international powers Although Khan a cricket star turned politician has claimed that the United States was behind his downfall an assertion that Washington denies he had lately fallen out with the country's powerful military over differences for the appointment of country's top intelligence chief The military has directly ruled the country for almost half its nearly 75 year history. It viewed Khan and his conservative agenda favorably when he won election in 2018 but that support waned over the appointment and economic troubles. Khan has also been giving the impression before his followers that elections are round the corner and they all should start preparing for the same. आपने सबने तैयारी कर ली है गली गली मोहल्ले मोहल्ले शहरों में गांव में आपने सबने तैयारी करनी आज से शुरू करनी है आपने मेरी कॉल की इंतजार करनी है जब मैं आप सबको इस्लामाबाद बुलाऊंगा अर्लियर दी न्यू प्राइम मिनिस्टर शहबाज शरीफ अपॉइंटेड अ मल्टी पार्टी कोलेशन कैबिनेट made up of former political rivals in opposition who united to oust Khan Sharif now faces a daunting task of pulling out the country from an increasingly deepening economic crisis A spokesman of the new government claims that financing needs next year are estimated to be around 30 billion dollars while the current account deficit in the ongoing fiscal year is about 20 billion dollars Pakistan's financing requirements this fiscal year are about 9 billion dollars 6 billion dollar for the current account gap and 3 billion dollars for debt repayments but despite the observers and experts urging the prime minister to take tough and unpopular decisions Shahbaz Sharif has chosen not to increase the petrol and diesel prices that have shot up almost everywhere around the world 21 रुपए और 50 रुपए ये बढ़ा रहे थे मुख्त मदाद में 50 रुपए पर लीटर 21 रुपए बहुत बड़ा एक महंगाई का एक पहाड़ अगर आवाम पे गिरता तो तीन दिन में लोग हमें बदवाएँ देना शुरू हो जाए उनको क्या पता कि पिछली हुकूमत ने क्या चक्कर किया और क्या चक्कर चलाया था कि वो हमें लपेटे उनको पता था कि शायद ये हुकूमत नहीं आ जाएगी तो फिर ये जान उनके काम जाने चुनाचे मैंने 21 रुपए लीटर और 50 रुपए लीटर वाली सवारी मुस्तरद कर दी है एज पर द डेटा प्रोवाइडेड बाय स्टेट बैंक ऑफ पाकिस्तान द कंट्रीज एक्सटर्नल डेट 
rose to $130,632 US million in the fourth quarter of 2021 from $127,023 million in the third quarter of 2021. The graph is descending rapidly and experts fear that a further drop might just push the country in a position where it will have to face a situation similar to that of its South Asian neighbour Sri Lanka. Moving on, the island nation of Sri Lanka has been at the centre of the South Asian news space for its continuously deteriorating economic crisis in the past few weeks. There have been swelling protests all across the country with prominent Sri Lankan voices, including former Prime Minister and former Chief Justice, joining the chorus demanding government's accountability in the crisis. Meanwhile, the government, which is in early stages of its talks with the IMF to seek a bailout, hasn't been able to hit any breakthrough. Protests in Sri Lanka took an unprecedented turn after a demonstrator was killed in a police shooting past week. The shooting was the first by Sri Lankan security forces during weeks of protests. The government, which has already found itself cornered on massive shortages of fuel and food owing to forex reserve depletion, seems to have invited another major trouble with people now even blocking roads and other activities to express their anger, propping another major law and order challenge. Several marches were carried out with floats reading, bring down the cost of living, bow down to the people's verdict and gotta go home. They have been essentially demanding President Gotabaya Rajapaksa to resign. And now, the dissenting voices are not just confined to common people and opposition leaders, but prominent political and judicial voices too have come out in open, urging the government to take responsibility for the crisis the country has plunged into. Former Chief Justice of Sri Lanka, Sarath N. Silva, called the island country's government a total failure while addressing Sri Lanka's economic crisis. There's a total failure of the government mechanism. The ministers have resigned. President is calling people to take up office of ministerial positions. They take up, next day they resign. So there is no confidence, there is no purpose. In any event, under the constitution, if a motion of no confidence is passed, once again the thing turns over to the president. President shall appoint another person as prime minister and shall appoint a cabinet of ministers. So you pass a note of no confidence, back again it goes to the same person. This is the whole problem. So it, will, it, it, is, it is not going to serve any purpose. Sri Lanka's total external debt has reached around $50 billion and it is not in a position to pay even for essential imports, including food items. Earlier, the government had said that it required between $3 billion to $4 billion this year to pull itself out of an unprecedented economic crisis. However, experts and observers feel it will take much more than that. Former Prime Minister is of the opinion that despite significant support from neighbouring India, which has supported the country with a $1.5 billion line of credit and has been shipping essentials, the country is unable to fend for itself in the coming future. India has provided $1.5 billion credit for fuel and for food. The fuel credit line will be over most probably in the first week of May. So there will be another crisis. The government has requested the Indian government uh, to give another, uh, give an extension of the fuel uh, line of credit. But I think there are also issues because since the government of Sri Lanka has declared itself to be bankrupt, uh, the question of our institutions deal, how creditors deal with uh, bankrupt institu uh, countries and institutions arise.
Meanwhile, Gotabaya Rajapaksa, who had proposed for a unity government in order to save the country from the crisis, has reappointed his cabinet following opposition's and allies' rebuff towards his idea. And while he has dropped a few Rajapaksas from his cabinet, Gotabaya hasn't been able to come up with any major ideas to go forward with. However, he affirmed that he was ready to go to any length to prevent further deterioration. Vivastave sidhu tu venaskam gana bhaitakale vivida deshapalna paksha visin prakashkan la dadahas parliament to tula saka chakul avashya venaskam sammata kata gani mata avakashya tibena e sammande navashya पूर्ण सहाय पूर्ण मावस्ताव का पाल में इन तोटा लबादी में टा ममसूदा ना Meanwhile, Sri Lanka is looking at making a decent case before the IMF to help preserve the economy. The government was hopeful of receiving some emergency funds within a week of talks that started on 18th this month. However, it doesn't seem to have convinced the IMF enough as of now. The International Monetary Fund said this week that it has asked cash-strapped Sri Lanka to restructure its huge foreign debt before a bailout program could be finalized as anti-government protests escalated across the island. Sri Lanka opened talks with the IMF in Washington this week after announcing its first ever default on external borrowings. Earlier this year, the IMF warned Sri Lanka's approximately $51 billion foreign debt was unsustainable. The IMF said that Colombo's existing debt also means the country cannot apply for emergency financing. This comes as a major blow to Colombo as they are seemingly running out of both ideas and even limited money they are left with. Overall, it appears that long blackouts, queues for gas and fuel and skyrocketing prices are nowhere close to disappearing from everyday discourse, at least as of now. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. Independence leader and Nobel laureate Jose Ramos Orta declared victory in East Timor's presidential election this week, saying he had secured overwhelming support and would now work to foster dialogue and unity. With 100% of votes counted, Ramos Orta had a strong lead with 62.09% of the votes, while Lu Olo had 37.91%, according to data from the Election Administration Agency. Ramos Ota is one of East Timor's best-known political figures and served as president between 2007 and 2012 when he survived the assassination attempt by rebel gunmen. He was a co-recipient of the Nobel Prize in 1996 for his efforts to bring a peaceful resolution to a guerrilla war in East Timor against Indonesia's occupation of the former Portuguese colony. Ramos Ota is expected to be sworn in on May 20 the 20th anniversary of East Timor's restoration of independence. By 2024, the spacecraft Orion developed by Lockheed Martin will bring humans to the moon in NASA's Artemis program. The system invariant analysis technology, one of NEC's artificial intelligence technologies, will perform in checks to ensure the spacecraft. It is tested and operating properly during the production phase. NEC and Lockheed Martin are developing new space technology through artificial intelligence. In the era of carbon neutral, Idemitsu Kosan is trying to develop new industrial field. 
The company has rich experience of chemical high level fiber material field. Its original material is SPS that is syndiotactic polystyrene which was first industrialized in the world in 1997. SPS has the strong points of heat resisting, electric characteristics and chemical resistant. A factory to produce SPS is under construction in Japan's Chiba prefecture. In 2022, a new factory in Malaysia will be launched, targeting export to Asia, Middle East and Europe. Edemitsu Kosan is developing technologies to reduce the harmful effects of carbon. For that, SPS could be transformed into various products to enrich lives. Moving on. Hindus across India and Nepal marked auspicious Hanuman Jayanti, the birth of mighty deity Hanuman. People from different towns and cities were seen visiting the temples to pray to the deity and seek his blessings. Indians across the country celebrated the birth of Hindu deity Lord Hanuman with offerings and sweets. The streets of cities across the country were filled with devotees heading towards a Hanuman temple to celebrate the occasion. Devotees reading the holy hymn book of Lord Hanuman known as the Hanuman Chalisa was a common picture in many temples. Every year, Indians observe Hanuman Jayanti on Chaitra Purnima, which is the day of the full moon of the season. Hanuman is worshipped for his undying loyalty to Hindu Lord King Ram and his consort Sita. In Hindu mythology, Lord Hanuman is a symbol of strength and power. He is also believed to help devotees get rid of evil influences. आज बाबा का जन्मदिन है और तहे दिल से बहुत बहुत बधाई बाबा की बहुत कृपा है मेरे पे और बाबा का जब जब नाम लेता हूँ जब जब मेरे कार्य सिद्ध हो जाते हैं Hanuman is a Hindu god and divine companion and devotee of Lord Ram. He is one of the main characters in the epic Ramayan and also mentioned in Mahabharat and Purans. He is believed to be a reincarnation of Lord Shiva and the son of Lord Vayu, the god of wind. However, there are ancient texts that mention that the three gods Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva combined to take the form of Hanuman. He is worshipped as a deity with the ability to attain victory against evil and provide protection. He is the symbol of strength, devotion and energy. He epitomizes selfless service and devotion. श्रद्धालु अपने अपने घरों से नंगे पैर पैदल चल के आए हैं जो रात को अपने घर से दस बजे करीब निकले और सुबह यहाँ पहुँचे हैं हम लोग भी अपनी गाड़ियों द्वारा शादरे से आए हैं और बहुत सारी बहनों को साथ लेके आए हैं और बड़े ही उत्साह के साथ आज हम अपने घर पे जाके अपने घर में दीप जलाएंगे और मीठे पकवान बनाएंगे और बाबा को भोग लगाएंगे और बाबा का जन्मदिन धूमधाम से बनाएंगे wield the kata a celestial weapon move mountains dart through the air seize the clouds and had a swiftness of flight lord hanuman is the patron god of martial arts such as wrestling and acrobatics as well as activities such as meditation and scholarship when hamina was young he mistook the sun for a mango and went into the skies to get the fruit however he got hit by a thunderbolt called vajra of lord in which disfigured his jaw in sanskrit hanu means jaw and man means disfigured hence affectionately called hanuman as the mistake was done by lord indra each god granted hanuman a wish lord indra blessed him with his body as strong as indra's weapon vajra fire won't harm him said lord agni the god of fire and lord brahma gave him the power which can move anything And this is the reason youths in India seek his blessings for strength. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care.
सब्सक्राइब टैग टीवी यूट्यूब चैनल एंड प्रेस द नोटिफिकेशन बटन